Go ahead, Council. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, the state calls Dr. Heather Gerald. All right. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Would you please state your name for the record and spell your last name, please? Dr. Heather Gerald. Well, what's your current occupation? J A R R E L L. Oh, there you go. I'm the chief medical investigator at the Office of the Medical Investigator. Okay. And what are your primary responsibilities as the chief medical examiner at OMI? I oversee the operations of the OMI, including approximately 200 employees and the forensic pathologists who are there. In addition, I also perform autopsies to determine the cause and the manner of death. Great. Can you give us a, a brief explanation about your educational background? Sure. I have a bachelor's degree um, from Valdosta State University in Valdosta, Georgia. Then I went to medical school at Mercer University School of Medicine in Macon, Georgia, where I graduated with a medical degree. Then I completed a residency in anatomic pathology at the University of Virginia, and I'm board certified in anatomic pathology. Then I completed a fellowship, which was a two-year fellowship in neuropathology at the same institution, and I'm board certified in neuropathology. And then lastly, I completed a forensic pathology fellowship at the uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, and I'm board certified in forensic pathology. Can you explain to the jury what forensic pathology is? A forensic pathologist performs autopsies to determine the cause and the manner of death. And what about anatomical pathology? A person who is an anatomic pathologist uh, can perform autopsies usually in a hospital setting to determine um, what caused death, um, but they also can uh, determine, like for example, if you have surgery and have something removed, let's say a, a, a cancerous lesion, the pathologist is the one who determines what type of, of cancer it is or, or disease it is. And approximately how many autopsies have you performed in your career? I have performed and supervised over 3,500 or 3,500 examinations, plus about 500 neuropathology consultations. And have you had any training uh, specific to injury analysis? Can you be more specific? Um, just training in terms of determining how uh, how an injury may have affected uh, an individual's body and how that may have contributed to the person's death? Uh, yes, that would be included in my forensic pathology fellowship. Great, and have you ever testified in court uh, as an expert witness in the fields of forensic and anatomical pathology? Yes. Approximately how many times? More than 50 times. Great, uh, and have you rendered opinions in, uh, in prior cases in regarding homicides that involved guns? Yes. All right. 
And does this include testifying to the entry and exit of gunshot wounds? Yes. All right. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I'd move the court to recognize uh, Dr. Gerald as an expert witness in the fields of forensic and anatomical pathology. Yes. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gerald, would you explain to the jury exactly what is an autopsy? An autopsy examination consists ultimately of two parts, both an external examination and an internal examination. In the external examination, we we document you know, features of the decedent, such as hair color, eye color, weight, and stature. But we also document any injuries that we see externally. We take measurements of those injuries, and we classify those injuries. The second part of the autopsy is the internal examination. I also neglected to mention that during the external examination, we collect um, trace evidence in suspicious cases. That might include fingernail clippings um, and hair samples. The internal examination consists of blood collection for toxicology when applicable and looking at every internal organ individually to look for injury and again classifying that in type of injury and also looking for natural disease findings. We also make um, microscopic slides as a result of that internal examination which we analyze by looking through a microscope and we form a, a final report with the ultimate goal of determining the cause and the manner of death. Thank you. And does every person who dies receive an autopsy? No. So what, what, um, how do you determine whether or not you're going to perform an autopsy? An autopsy, uh, I'll, I'll back up and, and explain that a little bit more. Um, within the state of New Mexico, the OMI is notified of all sudden and unexpected deaths. And for cases that are non-natural, there are certain circumstances where the OMI will take jurisdiction. And so in the case of deaths resulting from gunshot wounds, uh, this is an example where the OMI or the Office of the Medical Investigator will take jurisdiction. And in possible homicides, um, the, uh, the OMI will perform an autopsy. Thank you. Um, can you explain to us what is the intake process when, when a body arrives at OMI, what is that intake process like? Uh, when a body arrives at the OMI, um, the body is received in a, in a sealed body bag, so the chain of custody is maintained from the scene to the OMI um, to ensure that no one's tampered with anything inside the body bag. Um, we break the seal and we have um, a machine at the OMI called a CT scanner, just like in a hospital if you have to get a CAT scan. And the body at the OMI receives a full body CT scan. This allows us to have a look inside the body before we actually open the body. For gunshot wound cases, it lets us know if there's a gunshot wound track and if there is a retained projectile. And so that is a, um, the beginning of the intake process. Thanks, and, and I'm gonna get into some greater detail about the CT scan in this case and further questions. Um, but right now, describe to us with, as part of the intake process, do, is it typical for sometimes for items to arrive along with the decedent's body? Yes. So what, what, might, what might arrive? Um, per our state statute, anything present on the body should come with the body. Um, in this case, there were personal belongings that in included clothing um, that came present with Ms. Hutchins body. Great. Um, do you gather any statements uh, prior to conducting an autopsy? If law enforcement is present to view an autopsy, which is not uncommon, um, I will usually ask if they have any questions before I start. And I will communicate autopsy findings to anyone who is there to view autopsy. Uh, we also, before I issue cause and manner of death, when relevant, will review law enforcement reports. So you mentioned kind of the external examination. Is there another step to the autopsy process? There is the internal examination. Right. 
And can you explain what that is briefly? During the internal examination, uh, we make an incision on the chest and the abdomen to look at the internal organs. Uh, we also make an incision on the head and remove part of the skull to, to look at the brain. Um, as part of the external examination, what, what sort of things are you looking for on the outside of the decedent's body? On the external examination, again, we're looking at um, certain physiological characteristics of the, or physical characteristics of the decedent, but we're also looking for any injuries that might be present, and again, we take measurements of those and we classify what type of injury they are. And how do you document the external examination? The external examination um, is documented. I typically use a, a body diagram and I make notes. If there's any tattoos, I'll document where those are. Um, and then if there's any injuries, I'll document on a body diagram what type of injuries they are. And do you take photographs as part of this? Yes. Thank you. Um, and let's talk now a little bit in a little bit more detail about the, and the internal examination. Um, how do you proceed about conducting an internal examination? Do you, how much detail do you want? Um, just give me an idea in terms of, you know, are you looking for um, whether the death was caused by an injury versus a natural disease? Just kind of a high level description of what you're looking for. Yes, the, the combination of the external examination and the internal examination are looking at any documented natural disease or injuries. Um, if there are injuries, do they account for death? Is there any natural disease that accounts for death? And again, uh, when we perform toxicology, is there any toxicological cause of death or contributory factors to death? And as part of that, do you ever collect samples of tissue or fluids? Yes. And can you explain that process? Yes, we typically will collect blood uh, to perform toxicology to, in certain cases to determine if that caused death or contributed to death. Uh, as I mentioned before, we also collect hair samples, other blood samples that could be used for DNA testing uh, if needed later and we collect fingernails uh, clippings for what we call a so-called homicide workup. Perfect. Um, and was an autopsy performed on Helena Hutchins in this case? Yes. And who conducted that, au that autopsy? I did. Great. What was the date of that autopsy? The autopsy was performed on October 22nd, 2021. Great. And how did you identify the decedent as Helena Hutchins? Uh, I believe she was identified by a, a visual identification. We can also do um, comparison to identification, um, like a driver's license. Great. And what was your role in this particular autopsy? Um, I was the person who conducted the full autopsy. Great. So I'm the person who did the external examination and the internal examination, wrote the report, and certified cause and manner of death. Great. So it was you who was ultimately responsible for issuing the findings? Yes. Great. Um, did you review all of the photographs uh, related to the autopsy to form your opinion? Yes. Thank you. Um, were you able to render an opinion regarding the cause and manner of death uh, for Mrs. Hutchins? Yes. And what was your conclusion for cause of death? Uh, death was caused by a gunshot wound of the chest. And what was the manner of death? I certified the manner of death as accident. And can you explain why you classified it as an accident? Yes. I classify the manner of death as accident. Well, let me lift me back up to go to a homicide is classified as um, a volitional act caused by another to cause fear, harm, or death. Intent is not always needed. It is a common element, but it is not always needed. Um, conversely, for an accident to be applicable, what must, what's, what must not be present is an intent um, to cause fear, harm, or death. Looking at the uh, material that was available to me through law enforcement reports, it was apparent to me there was no obvious intent to cause death. It doesn't mean there's no negligence or so on, but it means there was no intent to cause death. Additionally, um, there are medical examiners across this country that would have certified the manner of death in this case as homicide. 
However, reviewing the material that was applicable to me, it is clear that there was a belief on the set that the firearm was not loaded with live ammunition. And based on that belief, and this scenario being much different than what we see in other medical examiner cases for firearm-related deaths, I felt that the manner of death was best class classified as accident. And thirdly, there has been somewhat of a precedent set in a previous movie set shooting death uh, where the manner of death was classified as accident. Great, thank you so much. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, when you first started your testimony that you sometimes perform a, perform a CT scan um, on the decedent's body. Did you perform one in this case? Yes. And what did that scan reveal? Um, the scan revealed that there was no significant natural disease for Ms. Hutchins. It also demonstrated a gunshot wound track. Um, it demonstrated that there was um, medical intervention prior to her death in the form of surgical intervention that was conducted at UNMH or, or the University of New Mexico Hospital. And it also demonstrated that there was no retained projectile within Ms. Hutchins' body. Thank you. Uh, when, when Ms. Hutchins first arrived at OMI, do you recall what she was wearing? She was wearing um, undergarments and she was wrapped in a hospital blanket. Okay. Did any um, clothing arrive with, uh, with her? Yes. And do you, remember, do you recall what that was? Yes, there was a, a jacket, or I classified it as being a jacket. And there was also a pair of, of um, tights and a pair of pants. Great. Um, at this time, Your Honor, I'd like to move for admission of states exhibits 113 and 114. They're photographs, and they've been stipulated to by defense counsel. All right, admitted. May I publish them? Yes. Is, is there an image on your screen? Yes. Okay. Um, does that appear to be the jacket that arrived with Ms. Hutchins? Yes. Did you do any examination of this jacket? I did a, a visual inspection. And, and why did you do that? Um, for firearm-related fatalities, we look for uh, defects of the clothing that correspond to any gunshot wounds on the body. Um, in particular, we will look at the defect that corresponds to the gunshot entrance wound, and we look for visible soot or dark particulate material um, that would help us indicate a range of fire. And, and did you find any of that on this jacket? No. Okay, and so what, does, what kind of conclusion can you draw from the absence of gunpowder or that kind of thing? The absence of soot, unburned gunpowder particles, and gunpowder stippling um, on the clothing and or body would indicate a distant or, or an indeterminate range of fire. Indeterminate range of fire would be applicable if there is an intermediate target, meaning that the projectile went through something else before it struck Ms. Hutchins. Um, there was no indication that the projectile went through anything before it struck Ms. Hutchins, and therefore the, the range of fire is best classified as distant. And, and just to be clear, when, when you say distant, can you, can you put some, um, some actual measurements to that, uh, perhaps in feet? It's difficult to say, but what we generally say very conservatively is that to get the best idea of the actual distance of the firearm to uh, Ms. Hutchins' body would be to do an um, examination or a um, um, sorry, the word has left me, um, a firearm test where you test the actual firearm with the actual ammunition um, to try to get the, the range of fire. However, generally speaking, uh, in forensic pathology, we can estimate that distance roughly to be about two feet or greater. 
two feet or greater. Great. Yes. Thank you. Um, if you look at your monitor, I put up uh, States Exhibit 114. Um, do you recognize these? Yes. And what are they? Um, these are the pants that were received along with Ms. Hutchins' body. And were, were you able to make any findings or determinations on the basis of these pants? There were no defects that were significant. The, the clothing had been uh, partially cut or cut due to resuscitative efforts, um, but there's nothing significant um, from my point of view with regard to the gunshot wound. Great, thank you. And uh, you've mentioned the gun, gunshot wound, so let's talk about that. How many gunshot wounds were there? There were two. Um, what injuries were you able to observe um, externally? There was a gunshot entrance wound in the right armpit region, and there was a gunshot exit wound on Ms. Hutchins' back just below the left scapula or the left shoulder blade area. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to move for admission of state's exhibits 115, 116, and 117. Um, these have also been stipulated to by defense counsel. All right, admitted. And may, may I publish those? Yes. Dr. Gerald, what are we looking at here? This is a photograph before Ms. Hutchins' body was cleaned, uh, which I typically do with regard to gunshot wounds. And the reason why I do this is because things like soot can wipe off. And so I like to take photographs before the wound is clean that demonstrates that there is no soot surrounding the entrance wound. But what is depicted in this photograph is a gunshot entrance wound in the right armpit region surrounding the entrance wound um, is an abrasion or a scratch um, that is likely due to the positioning of Ms. Hutchins' arm when she was um, when she was shot, and so that's just an abrasion that was caused by the, by the projectile as it entered the armpit area. Thank you. And you also mentioned um, an exit wound. Uh, can you explain what this photograph is? Yes, this is the gunshot exit wound, uh, which was left of the midline, left of Miss Hutchins' midline on her back, below the um, below the left shoulder blade. Um, it does show, and this is again before it has been cleaned, um, which again is a standard practice. But this is the exit wound. It has some bruising around the exit wound that was probably caused by uh, medical intervention and, and placement of of a plastic um, um, device to help render medical aid. Thank you. I'm gonna pull up uh, State's Exhibit 117 and this may uh, help, help you explain. I know you tried to explain where the exit wound was in terms of her back, so this may uh, give the jury a little bit better idea of where that was. Um, the, but just to be clear, this is the same exit wound as from the previous picture, correct? Yes. And do you notice anything uh, different or remarkable in this picture that you didn't already discuss in the previous one? No, it just gives a better orientation. Great, thank you.
Um, Dr. Gerald, based um, on the examination and your review of the photographs, were you able to track the path of the projectile from where it entered Ms. Hutchins' chest and, and where it exited? Yes. And can you explain that path? Yes, the projectile entered through the right armpit area. It missed the major blood vessels in the, in the shoulder area and in the arm. It entered the right aspect of the chest into the right chest cavity. It injured some of the blood vessels that travel along the ribs, broke um, some ribs or broke one rib, went into the right lung and exited the left, excuse me, the right chest cavity just adjacent to the vertebral column. It went through the spinal cord and traveled through the soft tissue of the back before exiting. And as part of that examination, did you use what's called a trajectory rod? Yes. And, and what does that help you do? The trajectory rod um, just simply shows the pathway, the general pathway that the projectile took through the body um, from the point of entrance to the point of exit. And that trajectory with respect to Ms. Hutchins' body is front to back, right to left, and downward. And were the injuries that Ms. Hutchins suffered to her internal organs consistent with being shot? Yes. Um, and of the, uh, of the injuries that you described, which of those can be lethal? There was documented in a medical record, there was over one liter of blood present in the right chest cavity when Ms. Hutchins arrived to UNMH or the University of New Mexico Hospital. And so that indicates significant blood loss within the chest cavity and the injury to the right lung was also lethal. Thank you. And uh, I know you mentioned uh, earlier that you took sam tissue samples for toxicology testing, is that correct? Yes. And what were the results of those toxicology tests? The toxicology was negative for alcohol and common drugs of abuse. Okay. Nothing further? Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Doctor, I first want to ask you about your classification. Now, you've been doing autopsies, you said, I think, 3,000 or 3,500? Yes, 3,500. 3,500. How long, how many years have you done autopsies? I came to the OMI straight out of fellowship in August of 2014. Okay, so 10 years. Yes. And you are very familiar with the classification system, whether it be a homicide or accident, correct? Yes. And in this case, you ruled the cause and manner of death to be accident. Yes. And in a homicide, your definition you gave was a, to rule it a homicide, it has to be a volitional act caused by another to cause death, correct? Yes. And volitional means purposeful? No. What does volitional mean? Volitional just mean well, volitional means a voluntary act. It doesn't mean that there is, in, it, it doesn't always mean there is intent. You don't need intent. So something as simple as pulling a trigger could be the volitional act. Okay, but in this case, you reviewed reports and you got information, and based on that, your determination was that this was an accident. Yes. And when you uh, said accident, I think you described that as what must not be present is intent to cause death. There should, no be, there should not be intent to cause fear or harm or death. Okay. That's correct. So in, in the materials you read and the information you reviewed, you did not find an intent to cause death by, by anybody? That's correct. Okay. And with regard to that classification, that is an official um, state of New Mexico ruling, correct? Yes. Okay. And that is an accident? Yes. Okay. I know in your notes that you documented the approximate time of the incident was about 1348, is that correct? Yes. And that is 148? Yes. Okay. And then you documented that Ms. Hutchins arrived at the hospital approximately 1520, is that right? Yes. And that is 320? Yes. Now, that is approximately an hour and a half delay, is that right? Yes. 
and you knew that she was being attended to by EMT personnel and there was a helicopter waiting to take her to the hospital, is that right? Yes. And do you have any idea why there was a delay in the hospital taking her? No. Okay. Now, during your findings, you did a CT scan before your external examination, correct? Yes. Did you find evidence of prior medical intervention from Ms. Hutchins? Yes. And what was that evidence of medical intervention? Uh, she um, had been intubated. Uh, the intubation was actually in the wrong place. It was in the esophagus. It was removed when she arrived at the hospital, but she was also re-intubated into her esophagus and so not into the airway. Um, she had also had surgical intervention, so they had opened up the chest cavities on both sides due to the presence of a gunshot wound. They had also opened up the protective covering surrounding the heart to try to do what they call uh, manual cardiac massage to restart the heart. Um, it's my understanding that she was pulseless upon arrival and non-responsive and not breathing. You said that she had a, an intubation then another intubation, is that right? Yes. And they were both in the esophagus? Yes. Now, an esophageal intubation can be a dangerous situation, correct? Uh, it's, it's an ineffective um, way to respirate someone or to establish air. And in fact, can, can that potentially cause um, an anoxic situation, a lack of oxygen to the brain? Well, the injury itself is what causes the anoxic situation, but the intubation into the esophagus isn't, um, isn't giving adequate airway establishment. Because, um, doctor, uh, when you do the intubation, you're trying to get it into the bronchus, correct? Yes. And the bronchus, uh, can you tell the jury what the bronchus is? The, the bronchus, the main stem bronchus is the main airway that goes to both lungs. It eventually divides into a left and right bronchus, and it goes to each lung. And so by putting it in the esophagus, that is basically sending uh, oxygen into the stomach. Yes. And um, part of your notes, I know you indicated that Ms. Hutchins was complaining of shortness of breath. Yes. And so an intubation into her esophagus would not have assisted with that, with helping her to get that oxygen. That's correct. Um, did you also find on your CT examination that there was a chest needle that was tried to put in? They attempt to. They attempted to put in a central line, um, which means you're trying to get fluid to in the, in the most effective way possible. Um, because of her situation, they had to put blood products directly into her heart. And did that, based on your review of that CT exam, it looked like it did not go in properly? Uh, no, it was in the it was in the heart. Oh, it was. They... I, I believe it was. Okay, um, so that wasn't a shallow insertion. Um, I well, I couldn't tell that based on the autopsy or the CT. Okay, so the esophageal intubation. Do you know who performed that? Do you know who did that? I do not. The C CPR efforts you observed, do you know who performed those? Um, not off the top of my head, no. I would have to review the medical records. Based on everything that you saw and as a medical doctor, had this not taken an hour and a half, had Ms. Hutchins received more timely medical intervention, could she have possibly survived these wounds? That's difficult for me to answer that question um, because I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor who treats gunshot wounds in the chest. Um, and I have a very skewed view regarding the lethality of gunshot wounds, so that's outside my purview. When you were interviewed, didn't you say she possibly could have survived? Potentially, but I'm not the best person to ask for that question because I don't treat patients. Okay, but you previously had said that. You acknowledged yes. that. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. I have nothing further. Counsel, for real quick.
Dr. Gerald, what was your determination as to the cause of death of Helena Hutchins? Her death was caused by a gunshot wound of the chest. Thank you. And um, you said that you performed this autopsy on October 22nd, is that correct? Yes. And her date of death was October 21st, is that correct? Yes. So you had approximately one day's worth of investigative materials available for you to review, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. You're excused. Uh, by court order, the uh, photographer is not allowed to uh, publish any of the OMI pictures. Those uh, that doesn't. Those are the autopsy photos, the three exhibits of the autopsy, and that's um, the order is either direct or or picking up it indirectly. All right, next witness. The state calls Stephen Moore. Do you swear do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Sir, go ahead and uh, state your name for the record. My name is Stephen Orr. How are you currently employed? I'm with the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. And what position do you hold at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office? I'm currently assigned to the Civil Division. Uh, how long have you been employed there? In the Civil Division or with the Sheriff's Office? With the Sheriff's Office. Uh, just over 15 years. And do you have law enforcement experience prior to going to the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office? Yes, I'm retired from the Albuquerque Police Department. How long were you with the Albuquerque Police Department? Uh, from 1990 to 2004. And did you become involved in this case somehow? Yes. How did you become involved in this case? On uh, October 28th of uh, 2021 at about 3.01 p.m., um, Sergeant Chris, I, for whatever reason I was at the office, I don't recall the reason why I was at the office that day, um, but Sergeant uh, Chris Zook found me in the office. Uh, he knows uh, my firearms background and uh, asked me to take a look at a rifle that they were having trouble clearing. What are you, what, what's your firearms background? Uh, I became a firearms instructor in 1991. Uh, I'm currently a master firearms instructor in, in law enforcement um, with handgun, rifle, uh, patrol rifle, and shotgun. Um, I'm a master uh, hunter education instructor. I became a, a hunter, edu hunter education instructor in uh, 2000, currently a master instructor um, for hunter education. I'm an armor and Glock pistol, um, AR-15 platform rifle, bolt action rifle, and police shotgun. You know a little bit about guns. A little bit. Um, on October, well, no, I think it was Maybe October 27th. On October 27th, uh, were you asked to assist with this case? Um, I, well, I thought it was the 28th, but it maybe, could, could maybe, have been the 27th. But it I, might have been the 28th that you got involved. That I got involved, yes, because uh, um, at the, the scene of this incident, I was not involved. I just, once again, happened to be at the office that day. Um, and Sergeant Zick, knowing my background, just simply asked for some assistance. Okay, I'm going to show you what has been previously entered into evidence as State's Exhibit 10. Okay. I, I'm not seeing it on the other monitors. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's already been entered in, in evidence, so I think we can publish it. Let's go ahead and do that. Do you recognize that? It didn't come up, but I, it flashed for a moment before, but you, yes. You don't have it in front of you? No, ma'am.
10? I do now, yes. Okay, yes, I, yes, ma'am. Do you recognize that? I do. Um, where did that come from, and how did, how did you end up uh, in possession of it? Uh, once again, I was, I was at the office. I don't recall the reason for the third time. I don't recall the reason why I was at the office that day. Um, Sergeant Zook, who was the, at the time the sergeant of the Criminal Investigation Division, asked me to take a look at this rifle. Apparently, it, uh, there, was, there were some cartridges that were stuck in the gun, and uh, he didn't know how to clear it, so he asked me to clear it for him. So what I, to answer your question, what I'm looking at here is a Henry Patton Allen Arms uh, 4440 lever action rifle. So let me ask you, um, was the gun jammed? It was jammed, yes. Why was the gun jammed? Well, first of all, let me explain the difference between a, a jam and a malfunction. Okay, a, mal a malfunction is something that can be readily cleared by, by the operator of the firearm. A jam is something that's gonna, gonna take uh, an armor or possibly even a gunsmith to, to take it apart. What happened with this particular firearm here, there was a, uh, a cartridge of the wrong size, the wrong diameter, um, entered into the, uh, the tubular magazine of the gun. And as Sergeant Zook was trying to uh, uh, eject the rounds, probably by, and I'm only guessing because I wasn't there, um, by moving the lever action back and forth to uh, eject the rounds from the gun, uh, the round of the wrong caliber wouldn't chamber into, uh, into the firearm, so then it couldn't be ejected. So did the gun jam because Sergeant Zook was manipulating the lever action, or did it jam because there was a wrong caliber bullet in there, or cartridge rather? Well, the cartridge wouldn't properly chamber, so since it couldn't properly chamber, it couldn't properly eject. So that's what caused the jam. So can you explain to the jurors um, how that gun would have been able to receive um, a, a cartridge of the wrong caliber to begin with? Yes. Um, do they have a picture of this gun in front of them? They do. Okay. Um, and your monitor has arrows and all kinds of stuff. I'm not, I'm not an expert at using that, but. Okay, this right here, um, you'll see, uh, and I don't know how to yeah, use the, uh, the arrow here. There's a lever right here that you can see, and you move this lever forward, all right, to the front Objection portion. Yes. Proceed, sir. Okay, the way this gun is loaded, all right, there, you can see right here this little little tab. Okay, it's held back by spring tension. You overcome spring tension by moving it forward, and the front of this gun here has about the oh, last three or four inches will rotate sideways, opening up what's called a tubular magazine. All right, um, for la a tubular magazine, for lack of a better term, is like a fat metal straw, okay? and the, the cartridges can be dropped down into that tubular magazine. Now, the diameter of the magazine tube is wide enough to accommodate slightly larger than caliber ammunition, and that is what happened in this case. Once the, uh, the tubular magazine is loaded, then the fore, end, uh, or the fore portion of the, of the uh, muzzle is closed up, and the, the rifle can be cycled by lever action. And what you have down here is the lever action, which um, basically is the action of the gun, hence the name lever action. So the 45 caliber cartridge was fit in that, did you call it a loading tube or? It's a, a tubular magazine. Tubular magazine. Uh, but the 45, because it was the wrong caliber, was 
was too large to cycle through. Correct. Okay. Um, and were you brought in to fix this gun and make it safe? Yes. And were you able to do that? Yes. Um, are how can this gun be unloaded once cartridges are put in the tubular magazine? Well, there are two ways to unload this gun. Okay, the first one is what I'm guessing that Sergeant Zook did. Okay, and all he did was this lever action right here that I that I have, have uh, pointed to. Okay, you work it back and forth in a lever action type motion. All right. And I can go through the mechanics of the gun, but the simple answer is through mechanical uh, linkage, the cartridge is removed from the tubular magazine, entered into the chamber, um, and then the extractor will pull the, the uh, round out of the chamber and kick it out of the gun. So depending on the number of rounds you have in the tubular magazine, if you have five rounds, in theory, you run the action five times and all five rounds will, will kick out of the gun, will be ejected from the gun. The other way to, to unload this gun, and the way I ended up unloading this gun, is once again, I showed you this little lever right here, pulled it forward, the front barrel of the gun will rotate to the side, and exposing the top part of this metal, metal fat straw that I, that I explained to you. All right, you turn the gun upside down, for lack of a better term, and, and gravity is your friend, the rounds fall out. Thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness. Cross exam. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, so the, the round that was actually in this gun, um, do you know if this was actually a dummy round that was inside? I don't know. Uh, would there be any danger if it was a dummy round that was inside? Um, if it were a, there was a, well, if you're, you're describing the two differences between a dummy round and say a, um, a blank. Okay, but you didn't know one way or the other? I did not It know. could have been a dummy round that was Could have been there. a dummy round, yes. Um, and it sounds like uh, Zook didn't properly unload this gun. Would you agree with that? I have no idea because when, uh, I don't know what uh, happened to the gun prior to me putting my hands on it. And, and I can only describe the configuration the gun is when I got it. What happened with Sergeant Zook prior to, to me taking possession of the gun for that brief period of time, I can't tell you. I just don't know. Well, Zook came to you because he couldn't figure out it himself, right? Yes. So, so he wasn't properly unloading it. Agree? I think he was trying, but I, but I would agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he was trying, he couldn't do it, um, but isn't this rifle, the way you just described this to the jury, it's pretty easy to unload, isn't it? Um, if you're familiar with the firearm, sure. I mean, anything's easy if you know about it, um, to, and you don't know until you do. So you just open the rifle and the rounds fall out the bottom, right? Um, well, it fall out the front. Or, or they fall out of it yes. once you open it, right? Yes. Um, and, and you said your involvement in this case was, or in that limited role, was because nobody really knew how to take this gun apart, right? Correct. And you told us that in a pretrial interview as well, right? Correct. Now, you don't know who loaded that rifle with that round? I do not. Cleared, do you? And you didn't interview any of the multiple people in this case who reportedly loaded firearms? I did not. No further questions. Redirect. So, hypothetically, if Sergeant Zook attempted to unload the gun by manipulating the lever action, as you demonstrated, is that an incorrect way of unloading the gun? No, it's not. It that's, is. That, that's a perfectly legitimate way of unloading that gun, correct? Yes, until the, the, uh, the incorrect round was attempted to be loaded into the chamber. Uh, up to that point, yes, that was a correct way of unloading the gun. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You're excused. Thank Next you. witness. Uh, State calls Byron French.
you guys raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Good morning, sir. Go ahead and state your name for the record. Good morning. My name is Byron French. How are you currently employed? I am employed by the Rio Rancho Police Department, but I am signed to the FBI's New Mexico Regional Computer Forensics Lab as a task force officer. So are you a sworn law enforcement officer? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you give us some indication of your background and training uh, with regard to cellular phone extractions? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll start when I, I first became a law enforcement officer. I graduated the academy in January of 2011 uh, from the New Mexico Law Enforcement Academy here in Santa Fe. Uh, the first four years I was on patrol and then the opportunity arose to become a digital forensic examiner at the New Mexico Regional Computer Forensics Laboratory. Uh, I, I got assigned that position and it's a, it's a two-year certification process approximately. Every examiner starts out working Windows computers, doing win, uh, forensics, digital forensics on Windows computers. And um, there is the opportunity from there to do digital forensics with cell phones as well. Um, during, that, during the initial process, uh, there's, there's just the pipelines of training and then I went through what's called the basic cell phone course with the FBI in Huntsville, Alabama back in, I wanna say 2017, July of 2017. Uh, from there, I've taken a couple of other different specialty classes when it comes to digital forensics and cell phones. Black Bag offers a uh, Macintosh forensics class, and part of Macintosh is the Apple um, operating system. Uh, from there, I've taken another handful of other courses such as uh, Celebrate. They offer what's called CCO, CCPA, and they are a forensic tool. And what CCO stands for is Celebrate Certified Operator. That is just one portion of the course and it familiarizes you with the best practices to extract data off of mobile devices. The second part of that is CCPA. It is Celebrite Certified Physical Analyst. And that teaches um, you best practices and how to actually go through the data that has been extracted. From there, I have taken uh, other courses such as um, a basic cell phone repair class. Uh, sometimes we get these phones in as evidence and they're destroyed. I have the ability to repair them. I have been through advanced training um, ISP and uh, JTAG and ISP, I'm sorry, ISP and chip off. ISP stands for in-system programming and chip off is, is just like it sounds, you, you take the chip off the device. Um, I've also taken what's called SANS 585 Advanced Cell Phone Forensics. And uh, just recently I've been invited out to become a instructor for celebrate themselves to instruct that those courses. How did you become involved in this case, if you recall? I believe it was back in uh, 2019. Um, was it 2019 or 2020? I'm sorry. I'm 2021. Having, 2021. Sorry, not enough coffee this morning. Uh, back in 2021, I was contacted by Detective Alex Hancock from the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office to assist with phone extractions. And did you perform a phone extraction um, on the cell phone belonging to Hannah Gutierrez? I did. And did you um, tell us a little bit about the the, uh, the extraction that you did, and and what are you? Um, extracting are you extracting text messages photos everything give the jurors an idea of what's going on sure so um, in this instance i did use the celebrate program to perform an extraction and there was two extractions involved one is called a logical and the other one is a file system and generally um, with those two extractions you try and extract Counsel, can you approach yes
Sorry for the interruption, sir. That's okay. Um, Pursuant to uh, Defense Counsel's stipulation, uh, will the court recognize Mr. French as an expert in what, what areas are you usually qualified in? Digital forensics. Thank you. Yes, digital forensic examinations. You're an expert. Thank you. Have you been qualified <coughs> as an expert in that area previously? Yes, ma'am, I have. How many times? Uh, twice. Once in the Honorable Martha Vasquez um, courtroom, not too far from here. And then the other in the Honorable Judge Johnson in Albuquerque, both United States District Courts. Federal Courts. Federal Courts. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> and uh, at my request, uh, did you uh, review a particular photo? I did. And pursuant to Defense Counsel's stipulation, I would like to enter into evidence and publish States Exhibit 118. and you may publish. He's got it. Do you see that photograph on your screen? I do, ma'am. Um, is this a photograph that was on Ms. Gutierrez's cell phone? Yes, it was. And can you uh, tell the jurors the day and time that this was taken? Uh, without looking exactly at the EXIF data, uh, do we have a picture of that by chance or? I probably do. That would help. I wouldn't want to put it up on that screen. Uh, do you, let, let me ask you this. Do you remember the date that it was taken? If memory serves correctly, I want to say it was around December 21st. And that might not be correct because I was right. okay. All right, sir. Um, let's uh, let's take a. Let, I think the year could inform the jury. You just said December 21st. But, but that it, that's not the correct date. So oh. I've looked at the exit data, <laughs> uh, so I know the correct date. So let, let's just take it. Get, Give us just a moment here to, to clear this up. So I need to disconnect. All right, we're going to take our morning break. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. And we'll be back about, uh, what was that, uh, 10, 10. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, you may be seated, we're in recess.
All right, you may be seated. Let's continue. All right. Thank you, Mr. French. Um, can you please tell the jurors the date that that photo was taken? Yes, October 10th, 2021 at 9.50 in the morning. Thank you. Elmo, please. The state is going to move for uh, the admission of state's exhibits 119 through 129. I don't believe there's an objection. No, no. Okay, sorry. Right. States 119, right. 129 through 129 are admitted without objection. You may publish. All right, thank you. Um, sir, prior to your testimony, did I send you some text messages? You did. Uh, are those text messages from the extraction that you performed? Yes, ma'am. On Ms. Gutierrez's phone? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm going to show you what's marked as State's Exhibit 19. Let's see if... If you can just give us uh, the date and time. Uh, and whether or not those messages are incoming or outgoing, who they're going from and who they're going to. Uh, sure. So both of these messages appear to be outgoing from the uh, what's identified as the owner of the device, Hannah Reed, to a contact named Becca Santa Fe. The first message has the timestamp at the bottom right of October 23rd, 2021, 1228 p.m. And it says, hey, Comma, I might be coming to Albuquerque tonight and was wondering if I can get that stuff. Uh, the next message has a timestamp of October 23rd, 2021 at 5.09 p.m. And it says, Becca, call me when you get a chance. And states exhibit 120. Can you see that or is it too small? I believe I can see it. Can you guys see it? Can, I, can the jurors see it? Yes. You bet. We'll zoom in and we'll just move it around a little bit. So the first message is an outgoing uh, from the same contact, Hannah Reed owner, to Courtney Santa Fe. Uh, the message states, he gets in in 30 mins or so Becca hasn't texted me back at all, and I'm trying to get my things from her tomorrow. This message was sent at uh, on October 23rd, 2021 at 6.20 p.m. The next message is from Courtney Santa Fe to Hannah Reed, the owner of the device, and it just says OK, uh, with the timestamp of October 23rd, 2021 at 6.24 p.m. The next one is from Hannah Reed to Courtney Santa Fe. It says, K, know if, excuse me, let me start over. K, let me know if you hear from her at all. Thanks for checking on me again. Miss you already. And that is time stamped October 23rd, 2021 at 625 p.m. So council has asked me to um, let you know that uh, some of this uh, would ordinarily be hearsay but they've agreed to let the um, let the entire um, portion in, and it's for context effect on listener. Okay, thank you. States Exhibit One Twenty One. Uh, another message from Hannah Reed to Courtney Santa Fe. Oh, I'm sorry. We just looked at that one. It was part of the it was part of the previous group. We'll we'll uh, take One Twenty One out. Um, States Exhibit 122. This one, the uh, top message is from Hannah Reed, owner, to Courtney Santa Fe. And the message says, could Becca maybe drop off my things to y'all since I haven't been able to catch her. That is uh, November 13th, 2021 at 7.02 p.m. The next message shown there is from Courtney Santa Fe to Hannah Reed owner. I asked her to, hopefully she will. 
and that is uh, the same time or the same day, uh, November thirteenth, two thousand twenty-one, at seven o six p.m. States Exhibit one twenty-three. The top message is from Hannah Reed, owner, to Becca Santa Fe. Hey, coming to Albuquerque tomorrow. That is time stamped November. It looks like 7th, 2021 at 2.52 p.m. And the next message is from Hannah Reed owner to Becca Santa Fe. Gonna be there for a week or so. November 7th, 2021 at 2.52 p.m. States Exhibit 124. The top one is from Becca Santa Fe. Uh, from Becca Santa Fe to Hannah Reed owner. I'm in Roswell working on Barron and Toluca and that is time stamped November 8th, 2021 at 9.20 a.m. The next message is from Hannah Reed owner to Becca Santa Fe. Ah, is that far? Bummer, I wanted to see you. And that is November 10th, 2021 at 2.39 p.m. States Exhibit 125. This one is from Hannah Reed owner to Becca Santa Fe. And it says, hey Becca, mind if my brother-in-law picks up my things from you after Thanksgiving. He lives in Albuquerque. That is timestamp November 22nd, 2021 at 5.53 p.m. States Exhibit 126, I know these are um, a little out of order. We'll, we'll pull them together with another witness in terms of their chronology. Go ahead, sir. Uh, this one is from Hannah Reed owner to Courtney Santa Fe. Hey, do you have Becca's number? And that is October 23rd, 2021 at 517 p.m. States Exhibit 128. A message from Hannah Reed owner to Becca Santa Fe. Becca with the question mark on October 24th, 2021 at 11.31 a.m. And for context, 129. Um, this one, the first one is from Becca Santa Fe to Hannah Reed owner. And it says, hey, dot, dot, dot. I am in Hamas working on Big Sky Splinter Unit. That is October 24th, 2021 at 11.33 a.m. The next message is from Becca Santa Fe to Hannah Reed owner. How are you doing lady? And that is October 24th, 2021 at 11.34 a.m. Thank you, sir. I'll pass the witness. Cross exam. Good morning, Mr. French. Good morning, ma'am. Um, so you looked at phones, and I'm going to focus on uh, Sarah Zachary and Dave Halls. You looked at those two phones, didn't you? I did. Um, and for Sarah Zachary and Dave Halls, you bookmarked a very limited data that you extracted, right? Yes, ma'am. So you, so you didn't extract all the data on Sarah Zachary's phone, right? I did full extractions on all phones that were given to me, ma'am. And then you bookmarked the limited data and passed that on to Detective Hancock, right? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. And the same for Dave Halls, you, you bookmarked limited data and passed that on to Detective Hancock, right? Yes, ma'am. But isn't it true that you don't know the significance of any of the items you bookmarked um, and what they have per to do pertaining to the shooting event, do you? Can you phrase the question differently, please? Sure, and, and you talked about this a little bit in your pretrial interview. Um, the significance of the items from the phones of Sarah Zachary and Dave Halls, um, you bookmarked those, but you don't have any information, you don't know the significance of what you bookmarked in relation to the shooting event. I don't know if I would word it as significance. I, I generally do what is requested of me within the request form. Okay, so do you remember giving a pretrial interview in this case? Um, November 29th of 2023? I do. Okay. Um, and, counsel, I'm referring to page 5, lines 19 through 24. Okay. Um, and do you remember being asked 
specifically with respect to the examination of Dave's Hall, Dave Hall's phones. Um, so of these items from his phone, do any of them have any significance to this event, this shooting? And answering, I don't know. I just booked market for the case agent. That way she could make her determination. That's correct. I didn't say that. Okay. So, so then you'd agree with me that the items that you bookmarked um, and gave and passed on um, that we're, we're talking about here today pertaining to, to Dave Halls and Sarah, um, you don't know the significance of those items pertaining to the shooting. Well, ma'am, it is not my job to determine significance. Exactly. I just determine, or I don't even determine, I just find what is asked of me within the request form and I leave it up to the case agent and to continue her investigation with it. Okay, and you, you also don't have any texts between Sarah Zachary and Seth Kinney before October 21st of 2021, right? I do not remember. Okay, do you remember your, your um, uh, did you review your report prior to coming into court to testify? Uh, there was multiple reports for this and unfortunately I can't commit all of them to memory. Okay, so sitting, sure. Okay. Um, so, so sitting here today, um, it, it, is it fair to say you don't remember um, any text messages in your review uh, between Sarah Zachary and Seth Kinney? I don't. Before October 21st of 2021? I don't, ma'am. Okay. Um, and you weren't asked to examine Seth Kinney's phone, were you? I don't believe so. That was not one of the phones that was given to me. And you weren't asked to examine Alec Baldwin's phones, were you? No, ma'am, I was not. Uh, is that unusual to you that in a shooting case, um, not to be looking at the, the shooter's phone right away? Not not always. Okay. Um, but but regardless, the, your, the work you did in this case was limited to what Detective Hancock specifically directed you to do, fair? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, just a moment, Your Honor. 
redirect. Mr. French, are you aware that Mr. Baldwin submitted his phone for extraction in the state of New York? Yes, I am. Thank you. I have nothing further. This is excused. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next witness. He calls Luke Hayes. Please don't talk to any of the witnesses, sir. And also, as a reminder, no witnesses that have not been called yet should not be on the watch live stream or the reserved ones other than experts. You know, just let's hang on and do it when, when we get there. We've got to go through his background. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you'll give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, thank you. Have a seat talking to the microphone. Uh, Your Honor, pursuant to our uh, agreement with security in terms of firearm safety, uh, uh, Mr. Rice is going to provide Mr. Haig with a box that has a firearm in it. That has been cleared. Yes. I suspect Mr. Haig will clear it again. It is cleared. Sir, can you go ahead and state your full name for the record? Lucian C. Haig, spelled H-A-A-G. How do you spell your first name? L-U-C-I-E-N. How are you currently employed? I have my own consulting firm in Carefree, Arizona, Forensic Science Services. What does Forensic Science Services do? I'm involved in firearms evidence examination, primarily the reconstructive aspects of shootings. Distance determinations, uh, long range shootings, is it a ricocheted bullet? Uh, how close was the gun when it was discharged? Those are all reconstructive issues beyond the usual identifying a bullet or cartridges having been fired from a gun. That's something I also do, but my main focus is the reconstructive aspects of shootings. What were you asked to do in this case? Well, a number of things to determine uh, how and, the and, and let me let, let me stop you real quick. Were you asked to do reconstruction or were you asked to do more examination and identification? Identification was a small part of what I did. I did do that with the evidence cartridge case, but primarily reconstruction. On this, in this case? That's correct. Okay. Um, and can you uh, give the jurors an idea of your background and experience, please? Yes, most uh, criminalists, which is my uh, professional title, have a degree in one of the physical sciences. Mine is in chemistry with some minor in physics. Uh, that was obtained in 1963 from the University of California at Berkeley. I then went to California State College at Long Beach, taking two more years of study, which included two semesters of criminalistics. That course was taught by the primary firearms examiner for the city of Los Angeles. Other courses were mathematics, clinical chemistry, documents examination. That takes me to 1965, when I gained employment with the city of Phoenix Police Crime Laboratory as an entry-level criminalist. Um, I was sent on to Arizona State University, a local university, for additional coursework. I started attending meetings of professional organizations that deal with firearms evidence because that became my main focus in the crime lab. Although I worked in all sections, I later supervised them. My real interest and passion was the ballistics or firearms unit of the laboratory. I left there 
there being the city of Phoenix Crime Lab in uh, 1982. So I was there about 18 years. I've been doing some private consulting, some teaching at that time. I was an instructor in criminalistics, which included firearms evidence. Um, I started my own company when I left the city of Phoenix. My company became my full-time employer and I've been working there ever since. Sir, do you have any professional memberships? Yes, there are a number of them. The, the most important one is an organization called AFTE, A-F-T-E, the Association of Firearm and Toolmark Examiners. Uh, I'm a, a longtime member. I became uh, president in 1985 and 86, served on a number of committees. Other organizations include the California Association of Criminalists. That's the nearest regional area. I'm a distinguished member of that organization. I'm a member and fellow in the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, which has a criminalistic section. I'm an associate member in a European organization. Um, that's most of them. Okay. Uh, can you summarize for us your uh, presentations and publications? Yes, I'm very passionate about presenting evidence among our our peers in the AFTI group. So to date, I've presented, and most of them have been published, about 200 publications over the last 50 years or so. Um, I've authored with my younger son, who you'll probably hear about, a textbook on shooting incident reconstruction, which is now in its third edition, with the unimaginative title, Shooting Incident Reconstruction. Um, uh, have you received any citations or awards? Yes, the AFTI group I mentioned before has voted me Key Member of the Year Award several times, Distinguished Member Status, likewise the California Association of Criminalists, and they have a fairly uncommon award called the Roger Green Award that's for historical work, and I'm very interested in history, especially cases that involve the use or misuse of firearms, so I received that award from the CAC. And. Um, have you been qualified as an expert in the areas of firearm examination and or reconstruction? Many times. Approximately how many times? Well, over the last uh, well, more than half a century, 57 years, several hundred times, I'm sure. Uh, have you been qualified in both state and federal courts? Yes, I have. Um, have you been qualified in numerous states in the United States? About half of the states in the United States and several foreign countries. What foreign countries? Uh, Northern Ireland, uh, case in Guam, um, I think, and in Canada. Okay. Several times. Um, sir, do you have any particular interest or expertise in uh, single action revolvers or old Western style revolvers? Uh, Yes, I'm interested in all types of firearms and their mechanisms, but single action guns are, of course, what we see in, in Western movies. Um, they're fairly straightforward, they're historic. Sam Colt is a well-known name, um, and he was an inventive genius, and his firearms uh, to this day are still prized as collector item if you are so lucky as to have an original. Um, and how did you become involved in this case? I think it started with a phone call in March of last year where the, I was well aware of the case. I'd heard about it. I didn't know much about it other than there'd been some sort of a misadventure on a set with a death and an injury. So after that, documents uh, were received. That's where I start every case. I want to read what's known about the case, what the issues are. Uh, interviews were sent to me, um, a lot of photographs, and ultimately, uh, in July of last year, I went to the local property room with the custodian there, and along with my younger son, Mike, uh, we received, well, I think it inventoried over 50-some items, but some of these had sub-items in them. So that was, that was the beginning. Um, as a part of the document review that you did in this case, did you review uh, the ballistics report and the case notes from the FBI. Yes, I did. Okay, so um, expert? 
Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, is there any objection to tendering Mr. I'll ask the court to, to uh, accept Mr. Haig as an expert in uh, firearms examination and reconstruction. All right, no objection. Yes, he's such an expert. Thank you. Um, sir, in it, so, so in addition to reviewing the FBI uh, examination report and the case notes, uh, you also took numerous items of evidence into your own possession and performed testing on those, uh, on those items. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, was the uh, evidence revolver in this case that I'll refer to as the Baldwin revolver, was that, was that one of the items that you, that, that you took into your possession and tested? Yes, it was. Um, let's start with the FBI report. Let's go ahead and give me a screen. Mr. Bowles, is Mr. Higg your witness? Yes. Do you, do you want to look at these real quick? I'm going to um, move for the admission of state's exhibits 130 through 146 uh, and permission to publish with the witness as we move through his testimony. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. All right, states one, 130 through 146 um, are admitted and you may publish. Uh, sir, so we have on your screen States Exhibit 130, but, but before we speak directly um, to this, can ultimately, did you form an opinion, and I know we haven't gotten there yet, but we're going to, did you form an opinion about uh, how the damage to this firearm occurred? Yes, I did. And did you also form an opinion uh, as to the working condition of the firearm when it was received by the FBI? I did. Let's start there. Uh, what was your opinion with regard to the working condition of this firearm when it was initially received by the FBI? By various means, I could see that it was in proper working order as designed by the original uh, inventor. And tell us what you took into consideration in coming to that opinion. Well, there are several ways. One of them is on my screen. I don't know if it's on your screen or not, but it's from the FBI examiner's report, a man named Bruce uh, Ziegler, I believe. Who Bryce, met. Bryce, yeah. But I looked at all of his photographs and notes. And on the left side are the four positions that the hammer can have with this gun when it's working properly and undamaged. The top one shows the hammer fully forward and down. That's the way it would appear if you had just fired it or even dry fired it. The next picture down looks pretty much the same, but it's not. The hammer is about an eighth of an inch rearward. Uh, and now it has engaged an internal mechanism, a safety notch. So now the hammer and firing pin cannot reach a fired a live cartridge, I'm sorry, a live cartridge. The third picture down is the loading position, also known as half cock. The previous position could be called, and it's often called, quarter cock. At that half cock position, the third picture down, the cylinder, which holds six, capable of holding six cartridges, is now free to rotate. Prior to this, in the upper two pictures, it was locked and secured by a small latch that we can't see in these pictures. Final picture 
and the most important one, the hammer is at the full cock ready to fire position. You can now see the firing pin in the hammer, that it's fully rearward and it's staying there. That will be important uh, uh, later. And, and if you would, um, because it, describe for us what the firearm is that you have in front of you. Is that this exact gun? It's the brother to the evidence gun. Same make, model, caliber. Uh, it's just not the evidence gun. And um, would you demonstrate for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, the the different positions and also uh, specifically the half cock position and the rotation of the cylinder? Sure. Well, I checked it, but again, just so everyone feels as comfortable as they're going to be around a firearm. Hang on just a second. You should probably stand in the middle. Yeah, do you want to stand? Okay. And uh, sure. That would be great. I'm left hand dominant, so I have to explain that. The hammer is fully down. If there were a live cartridge in this gun, the firing pin would be resting right against it. So this is an unsafe carry position if it were a loaded gun. It would also be the position if I had just fired it. There would be a spent cartridge. The firing pin would be deep into the primer of that cartridge. You can also see that the trigger is back. Now when I pull it there, that's the safety position. Very little movement, but the hammer is now about an eighth of an inch rearward. The trigger has just popped forward, so it's got an internal spring that is resetting. Cylinder is still locked up, cannot rotate. Now when I pull it to the load position, you may have seen the cylinder rotate already. It's free to rotate now. The little latch that I mentioned, which we can't see, has been pulled down by that motion. There's a loading gate here on the side that's opened, and this is where I would either remove fired cartridges or place live cartridges up to a total of six. After loading it, fully loading it, I close that gate. I have two choices. If I'm ready to shoot, I'm going to cock it. And if I've decided what I'm going to shoot at is to be shot at, pull the trigger. Hammer falls off of a ledge, a little notch. Actually, it's more of a step on the hammer. So now we're back to where we were a moment ago. If I'm going to fire it again, pull it all the way back. Hammer stays in position, which we saw in the photographs, which again is important because when we get to the damage that occurred with the gun, hammer won't stay there. If I'm going to let it down, if I'm going to render this gun safe, I just have, I'm not going to shoot. I do have to pull the trigger, but I get my thumb firmly on this spur. Pull the trigger, let it down. Once I get past the halfway point, I can let go of the trigger and it engages the safety notch again. So there's all the steps. It's called a single action. You've probably heard that term a couple of times because pulling the trigger accomplishes one single thing. It fires the gun. Um, in, in terms of, sorry. In terms of that loading gate uh, and the, the loading of the gun, um, if you were to, Show me the primers and the head stamps uh, of the of the rounds that you have in the gun, and we know that there are none. But this is we're just going to play pretend. Uh, show me how you would show me what's in that gun. Well, I bring it up. No one downrange. Here, maybe we go this way so that I bring the hammer to half cock. Okay, we want to show the jury. Let's go over here. Let's so they can they can see oh, behind okay. us. There we go. The, she used a term, an industry term, the head stamp. It's what's written on the cartridge, and in the middle of which is a primer. So if she wanted to see, or any of you wanted to see, are there fired cartridges in here, live cartridges, all six? I just rotate the cylinder. And we go a couple of times around, see if there are any empty chambers, or fired cartridges, or live rounds. If we wanted to take them out, if they're live, you just dump them out. If they're fired, you need this ejection rod here to knock a spent cartridge out because it's expanded. So if you were to show me 
the rounds that you have in the gun uh, in this manner, I can only see the head stamp and primer of one cartridge at a time. That's right. In, in this view from behind the gun with the gate open. Okay. Thank you, sir. Right, you take seat. my seat? Yes. So, when you, oh, thank you. Um, is there anything else that you can think of uh, from the documents that you reviewed uh, that, uh, that, that went into, that contributed to your opinion that the gun was in uh, proper working order when it was received at the FBI? Uh, yes, the examiner was able to fire at least 12 live cartridges for comparison purposes uh, to recover bullets and fired cartridge cases. Uh, the gun had to be in working order to do that. Had it been in the condition I later found it, uh, you wouldn't have been able to do that. And the condition that you later found it, can you just kind of describe um, what what was wrong with it when you took it into evidence? And I'm going to pull a, a, an aid up. This is going to be an exhibit that's already entered into evidence, Exhibit 97A. It had been dis dis partially disassembled. It was in a gun box with some ties. I'm working on it. <laughs> Hang on. Um, Okay, uh, if you can use this as an aid and, and sir, your screen, uh, you, you can, you know, use it to draw lines and okay. all kinds of stuff. So it's a touch screen. It is, if, yeah. if you need some assistance. This is one of the FBI, of the many FBI pictures, and you're looking at three parts of the gun. The obvious one's the hammer. I'm just going to show you how to mark it and uh, get rid of it. How do I erase it? Okay. The hammer's pretty obvious. Here's the firing pin. I really wanted to make a circle. It's making arrows. Can it? <laughs> you tricked me. We're looking at the hammer, and I'm really pressing hard. The hammer, the important part of the hammer are these notches you can see here. There's two clear notches. Something goes in them. Well, one of them is the safety position. The next one is the load position. The one that's very difficult to see, and I almost obliterated it, is down at the bottom of my circle. That's, the f that's where the full cock step would be, but it's been uh, peened, P-E-E-N-E-D. It's been uh, knocked off, rolled, rounded off, and it's full of very rough tool marks. The piece that would fit into each one of those is the trigger, and the trigger is the black piece here, but the tip of the trigger in the industry is called the sear, S-E-A-R, that's the piece that goes in those three locations. And it really sets, it rests on this step when it's in the full cock position. So that's somewhat tenuous and the pulling of the trigger causes it to slide off the hammer to fall. There's a little piece in that circle I just drew. That's the broken off sear of the trigger. So it's an incomplete trigger. 
And finally, the object up here has two names. The, the company that makes this reproduction gun calls it the Bolt, B-O-L-T. Uh, I've always called it a cylinder stop latch. It was the thing that was securing the cylinder in the safety position, uh, in the uh, full cock position, but not in the loading position. That, the left side of that goes up into the notches in the cylinder for those previous positions and drops down and allows the cylinder to rotate in the load position. So looking at those both photographically and in person, I could see that the full cock step or notch on the hammer was broken away, beaten away, or knocked away. Kind of hard to describe it if you don't see it under the microscope. And the sear was broken off. And the stop latch, uh, the little wings, there's two pieces that protrude out. Uh, that also was broken, and the gun can't work in the normal fashion if it had been that way on the movie set. And based on your document review, do you have an opinion about how uh, the, the bolt, the trigger sear, and the hammer were damaged? What, what took place that caused that damage? The hammer had to be in the full cock position, and one or more substantial blows, impacts to the hammer. Because it's just sitting, the, the, the sear and the trigger and the full cock notch are just sitting there engaged with each other and it's a small area. So if you give a substantial blow, one or more, to the back of the hammer, it is stressing that area and it will finally, and did, finally fail. And I can see under the microscope a lot of very rough tool marks where it's just rolled over and rounded off. It's no longer a step. It's a rounded area, which cannot retain the trigger even if it was intact. What's your understanding of, of the circumstances of the blows you're talking about? As I understood reading the examiner's notes and report, it was an evaluation of whether this gun uh, was prone to accidental discharge by an impact to the hammer. Okay, we're gonna uh, look at a, a few other photos here. Before I take this photo down, I'm going to pause. Yeah. Council approach. Um, Mr. Haig, let's, uh, let, let's shift gears for just a moment. In, in, based on everything that you reviewed and also the, the, the uh, examination and the firing of this gun uh, that you yourself participated in, have you seen any evidence that the full cock hammer notch was filed or modified to allow faster shooting? No. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm showing you what has been marked as State's Exhibit 134. Can you explain uh, to the jury what we're looking at here? Yes, you're looking at two triggers from a Colt reproduction single action revolver. The lower one is from probably the very pistol that's here today. It was a new Pieta Colt single action that uh, my younger son owns. So that's the way it should look. The one above is the broken damage trigger and the tip 
of the sear is not even present in this picture. So that area that's missing, I'm just trying to get the hang of this, it's right there. Okay, um, and I'm gonna show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 137. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, this is a view through an instrument called a stereo microscope uh, to which a camera's been attached. And you're looking at a putting back together, so to speak, like a broken teacup where I'm putting the two parts together and all that roughness you see there are manufacturing marks. Those aren't breakage marks, but just when they made the part on the one side of it, it's been machined and under the microscope, you can see those lines. So if you look at that, you can sort of see the contour agrees. And if we put them, my son and I put them right back together, you just see a faint line. So we deliberately pulled them apart a little bit so you can see they're two pieces, not just a crack in a piece. So just to be clear, what we're looking at here in States Exhibit 137 is the trigger with the top part of the, or part of the sear and then the and then the part of the sear that was broken off, is that right? Yes, two pictures back. If you remember, there was a little piece of metal off to one side and the trigger with a piece missing. That's what you're looking at here. Those have been put back together, uh, are, are brought close together under the microscope. And this is just a demonstration that the piece of the sear that broke off fits back on to, to, to the trigger sear mechanism, uh, sort of like pieces of a puzzle. Yes, Okay. that it's not ground off or rounded off, it's snapped off, it's broken off. States Exhibit 138, can you tell us what we're looking at here? Again, you're looking through the microscope at the evidence hammer as I saw it, and this area, try to do this a little better, that's where there should be a nice right angle step, and there isn't. It's just rounded off toward the right. The other two are the load notch, and they truly are notches, and the quarter cock or safety notch. But the circled area should not look like that. There's no step there at this point. And it's your opinion that that uh, was shaved off during the aggressive testing at the FBI? Yes. States Exhibit 139, can you tell us what we've got here? Council, may I ask, were these introduced? Were they admitted? Yes. Earlier? I believe so. I, I asked to admit... Um, oh, 130 through 146, okay, thank you. Got it, okay. Go ahead, sir. You're looking at four hammers in sort of an oblique view. Three of them, my younger son and I provided. I bought two, he took one out of the revolver you saw here today, but the one here is the evidence hammer. And if you look across at the other three, you can see that they're, they're visually quite different. And again, the evidence hammer has very little left for the sear of even an unbroken trigger to rest on. So that was a purpose to just to show what do these things look like and does the manufacturer make them in a reproducible way? And of course they do. Okay, thank you. States Exhibit 135. Yes, this is the, again, company calls it the bolt. Um, I know it as the cylinder stop latch. You, as a user, would only see that part. It comes up and down inside the frame of the gun to lock the cylinder up or to release it. The rest of it's well within the gun and it's being operated when you uh, pull the hammer back and it's broken. One of the little ears or tabs uh, is broken off. Can you hold up your um, exemplar revolver and just show the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the, the, the area of that bolt that you have circled can you just show the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the notches on the cylinder where that engages? Sure. It, you might be able to see the notches here. They come around. That's where the, the latch goes in. You can't see the latch unless we disassemble the gun. If you were to have this in the jury room 
and you were to look through here, there's a little bit of daylight, I can see it pop up and I can hear it go into battery, so to speak. But otherwise you will not see it. You just know if it's working or not. And show me, I'm sorry, can you show me the notches on the cylinder where? Sure. Let's bring it to the oh, load position. Yeah, let's, let, let's walk around so that they can see it just a little bit better, especially since the, it's a dark metal, it's hard to see. I'll just walk down the line. My finger's right at one of them. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I'm going to shift gears real quick because then we're going to have to move to another machine. Um, the Were you also asked to examine some uh, ammunition in this case? A lot of ammunition, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 131. Do you recognize that? I do. What's that? It's a disassembled 45 Colt cartridge with a type of bullet known to the shooting community as a semi wad cutter bullet. The red material is just a, uh, a lubricant that can be any color. So it's not the red color that's important, it's the shape of the nose of this bullet called a semi wad cutter. And what's this? Uh, that states Exhibit 132. Uh, that's a much better picture of the contents of that packet. The cartridge case is on the right. The semi wad cutter cast lead bullet. This bullet was made in a bullet mold. Uh, is right there. You can see the truncated cone is the $10 description of that nose shape. It was going to be a cone, got truncated at the top. Again, semi wad cutter bullets, the other name for it. And in the vial is the propellant, and that's a propellant uh, very well known to me called Trail Boss. It's designed and intended for cowboy action shooting and lead bullets in traditional firearms like this. And sir, what was your understanding of, of the, the source of this cartridge, and, and when I say source, I mean in terms of the relevant locations in this case. This was one of a number of cartridges like this that came from a supplier in Albuquerque of uh, ammunition, okay. props, uh, dummy cartridges, so on. Do you know if that was PDQ props? Yes, that, I recognize the name. Okay, thank you. And States Exhibit 133, what's this? This is one of five live cartridges that were recovered by investigators from this scene. Uh, you can see, probably see, that the powder looks very different. It's smaller, it's darker, it doesn't have that little donut shape. Um, the bullet style is also very different. Uh, setting the blue lubricant aside, this is a round nose bullet with a truncated nose. So it would have been completely round had the bullet mold not had this flat area uh, to produce this, this flat appearance. And this is pretty much like a traditional bullet from the late 1800s, early 1900s. And again, a cartridge case, 45 Colt cartridge case is on the left. So if we have a live primer in that cartridge and put it all back together, it's a live cartridge, not a dummy. So Mr. Haig, if I went to a gun store and I bought a box of ammunition, would, let's say I'm buying 45 Colt caliber ammunition, would that box perhaps include what we're seeing in 133 and also what we're seeing in 132? From professionally made purchased ammunition, you're not gonna see an m and M situation or mixed, mixed bullets. They're all gonna be the same weight, style, same kind of propellant, same head stamps, and of course the same kind of primer. They can come either nickel plated or plain uh, brass. And the live ammunition that was taken from the set of the movie Rust, um, can you describe the characteristics of that live ammunition in terms of the head stamp, uh, the primer, 
those just sort of exterior identifying Yes, if we could go back to the other sure. e exhibit with the blue bullet, there's one of them. Uh, you can't see the primer, of course, because the cartridge is turned sideways, but it's a nickel-plated primer. It looks like chrome, you know, shiny nickel-plated. Uh, if it were back-loaded, you would only see the top, basically, half of the bullet. The part with the blue lubricant would be inside the cartridge case, and the powder, the gunpowder, in the little vial would, of course, be inside that cartridge. So putting it all back together, you'd have a complete round of ammunition. The head stamp, you've probably heard that term plenty of times, so I don't need to define it, for these cartridges was Starline. It's a very well-known manufacturer of cartridge brass. They do not manufacture loaded ammunition, at least not as I sit here today. So Starline's well-known. I use it myself. I'm a hand loader. Uh, that's what you would see if we turn that cartridge up so you could see it. And what color was the primer on the live ammunition? I think I said it, but I'll repeat it. Nickel plated, shiny. I apologize, thank you. Um, and let me ask you, do you know, can cartridges and ammunition that look exactly like this be purchased at local gun stores? In the gun stores I, I go to, yes. And uh, at my request, did you obtain some and send me some pictures? Both my son and I bought boxes of commercial 45 Colt ammunition with lead round nose bullets with a flat. Uh, meplet is the fancy word, M-E-P-L-A-T. It's the flat spot on the nose. The powders weren't necessarily identical to what we see here, but they're a type of pistol powder. Um, States Exhibit 141, what's this? This is the outer box of one of those, which I believe my uh, younger son, Mike, bought this one. Uh, HSM is a small ammunition company. Uh, you can probably read, it's meant for cowboy action shooting. It's a popular contest with uh, traditional single action shooters. Uh, and those cartridges have the Starline head stamp and lead uh, bullets with flat noses on them. I'm going to get there. Let's go to States Exhibit 140. What are, what's this? Well, you can see four of the cartridges and their head stamp in an oblique view. Uh, that They don't say Starline, but that's their symbol. Two little asterisks with a line going between them. Uh, and then, of course, the cartridge designation, 45 Colt and nickel primers, shiny nickel-colored uh, metal. And States Exhibit 143. This further characterizes the weight. In the United States, bullets are weighed in an archaic term, frankly, called grains. 7,000 of them in a pound. Uh, but 250 grain is the traditional classic weight of the Colt bullet. So this company, HSM, now tells us you can expect if you were to shoot one of these bullets and collect it and put it on a balance that weighs in grains, it's going to be around 250 grains, plus or minus a grain or two from the shooting and impact process. So the grain comes from weighing the bullet. That's right, just the bullet, not the cartridge or the powder. And just as, as an aside, did, did you um, examine the uh, projectile from this case, the projectile that was removed from Mr. Souza? Yes. And uh, are, are you aware of whether or not that projectile was 250 grain at the time that the FBI had it and the time that you had it? Yeah. No, it had lost some weight. It started out life, in my opinion, as a 250 grain bullet, but it suffered reduction uh, from probably two sources, a heavily fouled bore. In other words, the gun barrel through which this passes had a lot of fouling in it from a uh, black powder substitute, I was able to duplicate that phenomena. So the bullet now, like squeezing toothpaste, gets squeezed down a little bit and it gets some rubbed off. Plus it went through two people and it struck bone. If you've seen pictures of it, or if you do later, it's got a lot of impact damage from striking bone. So for those two reasons, it weighed about 240 grains, as I recall. 10 grains is not much. Uh, and it was now reduced in diameter to about 44 instead of 45. 
Um, but in your opinion, that projectile started out as a 45 Colt, 250 grain bullet. Yes. Um, and let me go to States Exhibit 144. What's this? One of the cartridges from that box of ammunition that you saw earlier has now been removed. So you see it's nice and shiny and new in the brass. And the bullet is, again, not too unlike the one with the blue lubricant in it. It's round nose and it's truncated, so it has that flat uh, front called a meplet. And just for completeness, States Exhibit 146. Yes, it's just a closer view of one of the cartridges from that HSM ammunition company. Uh, so this cartridge has the same physical characteristics in terms of the shape of the bullet, is that right? As, and we're comparing them to the live rounds found on set. Yes. Um, and th it, they have, both have brass casings, is that correct? Yes. Uh, they both have the Starline brass head stamp. That's right. And they both have nickel plated primers. Yes, yes they do. Thank you. Sorry guys. Um, Mr. Haig, at my request, uh, did you meet me in August at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department? August yes. of 2023. Yes. And and can you summarize for the ladies and gentlemen uh, of the jury uh, what the exercise was that we engaged in that day with uh, also, I think your son was assisting us. Yes, he was. Um, I had been requested, we had been requested to reassemble the evidence revolver with the broken parts, mainly the hammer and the, uh, the trigger. With the, just I think just the broken hammer with the knocked off full cock step to see if it even could be cocked and would retain the cocked position. And while we were there, did we take some videos? I'm sorry. Did you record some videos while we were there? Yes, we actually did it a number of times after we reassembled it with and without the cylinder in the revolver and videotaped, I think, six runs in one session and three or six in the other. We're only going to watch two. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's do it. I'm, I'm going to press, I'm going to get them started once you give me the screen. What's that? Thank you, Judge. Where are we? This is 147. Okay, hang on. Bear with me here. Stop. Let me stop it. Move into evidence. States 147 and 148. Any objections? It's, it's actually going to be 147 and 147A. Okay. All right. Any objection? No, All right. So 147, 147A is admitted. You may publish. Let me turn that volume down.
I'll play State's Exhibit 147. Hang on. I took it down too far. All the parts on the um, with the following exceptions. Is there an issue with audio? Is there evidence for volume? Describe what uh, we've done uh, to put it back in operating condition. All the parts on the revolver are original with the following exceptions. This is a new trigger and sear, same piece. It's the original hammer. It does also have a replacement bolt or cylinder catch. Otherwise, as mentioned, every pin, screw, spring, whether that's the main hammer spring or the flat spring that operates the trigger, are original to the revolver. So we, what we did is, j just, just as a recap, this, this is the Baldwin gun, is that right? That's correct. And the hammer, or I'm sorry, the, the trigger is, is, a, is a new unbroken trigger, is that correct? That's also correct. And the bolt, uh, that we saw in the photos that had kind of lost an ear. Is that replaced? Yes. But the hammer that's in this gun is the original hammer from this gun. Is that correct? But damaged. Yes. And that was the whole point. Does the, the damage, how does it affect the operation of the gun if we isolate the hammer? Um, so this is the hammer that you believe was damaged at the FBI? Yes. full composition. Hammer falls and is captured at the half cock position. Again. So what did you what, what did you ask your son to do? He's the one holding the gun. I asked him to go through the normal cycle. If you produced this firearm and cocked it and expected the hammer to stay cocked until you pull the trigger, it will not. Because that full cock step or notch has been rounded off, the perfectly brand new trigger cannot retain the full cock position. The hammer falls to what you just saw and it falls to that half cock notch. So the good trigger and its sear drop into that notch, preventing the gun from firing. So that's, a, that's intentional. That's what Mr. Colt intended. If somehow the gun got worn and the hammer started to drop when you cocked it, it's going to get captured. And if it gets past that point, it'll be captured by the quarter cock notch. Okay, demonstrate the positions of the hammer, normal positions. From full down where the firing pin is protruding from the breech. Uh, can you see the firing pin protruding from the breech in this video? Yes, when I first described how this gun works for you, the hammer is fully down. So it's either just fired a cartridge, or this would not be a good way to carry this gun with live ammunition, because that firing pin is resting right against a live primer if there was a cartridge in this gun. And it wouldn't take much of a blow. You don't have to hit it hard. Just drop it from a few inches in this configuration, and it'll fire to the, the cock, and from here, the trigger will not allow the hammer to drop because of the shape of the notches in the hammer. From the half cock or load condition also, pulling the trigger does not drop the hammer. And the cylinder is now out of alignment with the axis of the bore. And then the... Tell us what you mean there, and why is that important? Uh, in, in gun handling, you indicated that the cylinder yes. is now out of alignment with the axis of the bore. Well, the two things you just saw was starting to bring the hammer back all the way. Went through the safety notch, cylinder still locked up. But when you get to this position, the cylinder now rotates a few degrees, more than a few, about 10 or so. If somehow you were able to fire this gun from that position that you're looking at in the screen right now, there's going to be a real disaster 
because the bullet can't go down the barrel. Maybe half of it might, but the other half is going to be jammed up against that area. That's really hard to do. Uh, and you're probably going to blow the cylinder apart. You may get injured. So there again, what Mike and I were demonstrating is if you, it's called a slip off. It, if you're trying to cock the gun and you lose your grasp on it, the hammer falls, that safety notch captures it. And now if we get this far, it still is gonna be captured, but somehow if it got past that, the safety notch, you're gonna have a, a damaged at the minimum or a destroyed gun and probably an injury to yourself. And in this position where the cylinder is, is no longer aligned with the axis of the bore, uh, does the firing pin hit the primer every time? No. It can hit it just at one side, and primers are designed to detonate, and it's a proper term, with basically a central hit in the primer. If you get off to one side, you'll often have a misfire, a failure to fire. And if it gets any further than that, it hits out in the head stamp area, doesn't hit the primer at all. The more that cylinder rotates out of phase, which normally would be caught when released, drops. And with lateral pressure, both directions, this one's slipping the thumb off to the right side of the hammer, this one slipping the thumb off to the left side of the hammer, all catch on the half cock as long as the trigger. Why the example of the hammer slipping? Why would we do that example? Yeah. It can it can be a misadventure with this kind of firearm. One of them I described, you're trying to cock it and you lose control of it. If you haven't pulled the trigger, what you just saw will happen, nothing. It'll capture the hammer. The, uh, similarly, you can cock a gun and then decide, as I demonstrated, I wanna let the hammer down. I don't, you don't want it cocked. You're gonna have to pull the trigger. You're gonna have to coast that hammer down with a good thumb on this area called the spur and when it gets past the safety notch, the proper thing is to let go of the trigger and the safety notch will capture it once again. All right, this is August 24, 2023. Right. Mike Haig and Luke Haig at the Santa Fe Sheriff's Laboratory. No. Let's look at State's Exhibit 147A. Solving. Just tell us before we play it, what are we looking at here? This is the same evidence revolver. You're now looking at the other side, and we've removed the cylinder and the cylinder pin. Uh, is everything still the same, though? We've got damaged hammer. Yeah. Everything else works. Yes, yeah, everything else is the same. I think we wanted to see the stop latch working at, some, at one point. Okay, we'll go ahead and play this. 2023 in the property room of the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office. And Mike, you're on to describe what we've done to the evidence gun. So it's the item one revolver, the Pieta. Original parts include all the pins, screws, grip, the original hammer. It has the original hammer spring as well as the original flat spring that operates the trigger. The trigger is a replacement trigger, so the top of the sear is a functioning original piece, and as said, uh, original hammer. It does have a replacement bolt as well, otherwise all parts are original. Okay, and the hammer's in the fully forward position at this stop. The normal full cock position. Hammer falls, doesn't hold but the half cock notch captures it. Let's do it again. I'll take it all the way down. We can see the quarter cock notch also functions. Half cock functions. And then all the way to full. And you can see the stop latch finally in that view. It's this little piece right there. It went down when it got to the half cock and then came back up when it reached the full cock position because that locks the cylinder in alignment with the axis of the barrel. And again, when it was in the full cock position uh, and it was released and it fell and was caught at half cock, that was why? 
that was as designed. That's what it should do. In that situation, the cylinder would have been aligned, but it, in a way it doesn't matter because it wouldn't fire. No, I'm talking about uh, when when your son pulled it into the full cock position and it didn't stay there. Why didn't it stay oh. there? Again, the former uh, full cock notch or step has just been beaten off. It's just, it's just rounded. There's, there's no step there any longer. So it would be the same as the edge of this witness stand. If it were round, I couldn't do that. Slip off. Okay, I'm just going to go slowly through the video so that we can see the bolt that you were referring to. So I'm starting this uh, video at 1 minute 9 seconds. There you can see the stop latch right now. It's up because it's locking the cylinder if the cylinder were in the gun. And it's still up because we're falling from the full cock. If we'd come from the hammer down to this very position, it lowers itself so we can rotate the cylinder and load and unload the gun. Okay. Um, just for completeness, we'll finish playing it. Hold, but the half cock notch captures it. Let's do it again. I'll take it all the way down. We can see the quarter cock notch also functions. Half cock functions. And then all the way to full. And it fails to hold, but is captured at the half cock. I'll price, apply some lateral pressure to the hammer as I release it as well. That was to the right. This is to the left. And of course, because of the notches on the hammer, pulling the trigger at the safety notch or the load condition, those do not release the hammer. Okay, I think that covered. So based on the experiment that we did with this gun back in August of 2023, um, even if the hammer of the gun was damaged on October 21st of 2021, would the trigger have to be pulled for the gun to fire? Two things. Yes, the trigger would have to be depressed or pulled. The hammer would have to be at the full cock position and it can't be damaged because it would do what we saw here and what you just saw here would not fire the gun. So hypothetically though, even if it were damaged on October 21st, the operator, that being Mr. Baldwin, would have had to have pulled the trigger. If he, yes, if you could get the hammer to stay at the full cock position, <laughs> that's, that's the, the difficulty to overcome. Which it doesn't want to do. It will not do. Okay. Um, and did you have an opportunity to examine the uh, spent casing uh, from, from the, the Rust movie set in this case. Yes, I did. Uh, did you make any conclusions about whether or not that spent casing was fired from this gun? Yes, I did. What's that? I'm in agreement with the FBI examiner. I was able to match it under the microscope. There are tool marks on the breech face of the gun that print themselves, literally stamp themselves into the primer and he had, there were a number of test fired cartridges that the Bureau prepared, that I prepared, and under a specialized microscope for this purpose, I could see a very nice identification. So, in my view, the fired cartridge was fired in this gun. And then I went on to look at the shape, location, and depth of the firing pin impression as the next important question. And let's go ahead and talk about that. Uh, the, the, everything that you learned from the firing pin impression and what that tells you about the position that the hammer of the gun was in at the time it was fired. It tells me two things, that the cylinder was locked up and aligned, so the hammer had been pulled all the way rearward. If it had not, it wouldn't be in alignment from what I've shown you. Secondly, the depth of the firing pin impression told me from doing test fires, multiple test fires, and measuring all the 12 that the FBI lab conducted, 
that it was a cartridge that was fired from a full hammer fall, not from an effort to let the hammer down and slip off um, or any other misadventure, but rather a normal hammer fall from the full cock position. One final demonstration for us, if you would take your revolver out and come in front of the, the jurors. And you can stand right here so that you can speak into the microphone. So just for completeness, I would like for you to demonstrate uh, to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury using this exemplar revolver um, the position that the, what had to have happened on October 21st in your opinion for this gun to fire. Let's show them rather than give them a verbal description. It had to have a normally function undamaged hammer. The handler, in this case Mr. Baldwin, had to get it to this position. If he let go of the hammer, it would stay as you see it here. Pulling the trigger will fire it. Now you can do that as quickly as you're cocking, or you can wait minutes, hours. But when I do that, if there's a live round in there, it's going to fire. The firing pin impression is going to have the full depth from this. If, and I've done it, if somehow I did this, I'm trying to let it down, and I let it slip, it either won't fire at all, or it makes a much shallower firing pin impression. I did that multiple times with the evidence gun and with the exemplars. I own several of these, my son owns several of them. So I could distinguish by the depth and the centering, this was a normal hammer fall from the full cock position. So had the gun fired at a position le less than full cock, lower than full cock, in between full and a half, or half and quarter, you would be able to tell that by the depth of the firing pin impression, is that correct? If it, what I call a slip off, if you're trying to let the hammer down and you get about the halfway point and it slips, you also have to pull the trigger by the way, uh, it'll be a much shallower firing pin impression. It doesn't hit the strike, it doesn't strike as hard. And from the quarter cock, if you're trying to put it in safety position and you lose control of it, again, you have to pull the trigger. It just makes an indentation in the primer doesn't fire at all. Um, thank you, sir. If you can take your seat. Sir, it, in the, the what we call the discovery, in, in the documents and information that you reviewed, did you have an opportunity to review some videos of Mr. Baldwin on set in the church pulling the gun out of his holster. Yes, I did. And are you familiar with that type of holster? Yes. Are you um, familiar with this type of gun? I'm sorry? Are you familiar with this type of gun? Oh. I think you've indicated you are. Yes, I think I own six or seven of them. Okay. Um, is there anything particularly difficult or dangerous about pulling this style revolver out of that style holster in your opinion? Not so long as you don't load it, or if you do load it, that you don't cock it and pull the trigger. Otherwise, it's safe. It's an easy movement to make. Uh, I have no problem with how to do that. When you say it's an easy movement to make, can you think of anything, you know, that the gun might get caught on or, uh, or, or anything that, that could create danger? Not realistically, again, the hammer secures itself well to be drug across clothing, uh, and if it fell without a trigger pull, um, and the trigger's well shielded with a trigger guard, but if somehow the hammer got pulled off the full cock position, you've already seen what's gonna happen. It gets captured at the half cock position. All right, thank you. I'll pass the witness. Mr. Bow, I'll have you disconnect us. Can I maybe approach for a moment? lunch break. Please don't talk among yourselves or anyone else about the evidence received here in court. 
Um, we'll be back at um, council. What time do you think? Council. Yes, Your Honor, I apologize. Well, it's 11.38. You want a uh, quarter of? Yeah. Sure. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Okay. So, uh, quarter of one. Quarter of one. Do I have that right? <laughs> yes, you have that right. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. Um, and since you're a witness, don't talk to other witnesses. I understand. Yeah. All rise.